mere mortals, that you think of them. They are like a breath. Their days are like fleeting shadow. Please allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this year of 2020, 20 has been a year of many unexpected things. But we know, Lord, that you knew exactly what would happen. And Lord, you tell us to not fear. We are not to fear, Lord, because you are the one who is guiding us and you promised this to us. And Lord, just as you have promised, you still will always hold on to us and you will never let us go providing guidance to us. We thank you so much for this. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for the grace you've provided for us and especially for the new year. We thank you, Lord, that it can be provided to all people. Through Pastor Anjiki this morning, we ask, Lord, that we can hear a word from you. Please work in our hearts, Lord, so that we can hear your voice. We ask that the Holy Spirit work in a strong way. And please provide us with encouragement. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. 2020 is about to come to an end, and today is the last uh, Sunday service of the year. Today, we're going to be looking at Psalm 144. We just read verses 1 through 4, but the message will actually cover the entire passage. There was once a mother who was actually called uh, to school uh, because of something her son had done. So she went to school, and her son's test said to her, your son cheated on a test recently. And so in English, uh, cunning, which is Japanese, is said to cheat anyway. So it's he was cheating on the test. And so the teacher was you know, proclaiming this to the mom, that your son has been cheated on this test recently. And the mother was like, oh, no, my son would not do such a thing. But the teacher said, well, actually, he cheated after the uh, kid who was sitting next to him. And, like, you can look at their test and tell that they're exactly the same answers. The same, they have the same answers. So, like, the places that are correct are the same. The places that are wrong are also the same. But the teacher's like, no, um, teacher, you know, it's, it, it could have just been by chance that they had the same answers, right? And... Also, it's possible that the kid sitting next to my son actually cheated after my son. There's also that possibility, isn't there? But the teacher showed the mom the um, test, and on the last um, test, it was a when you had to like actually write out the answer. And so the the kid next to her son had written, "I don't know the answer," and then her son wrote, "I also don't know the answer." <laughs> Uh, so um, he apparently cheated. <laughs> actually, when I see something that somebody has, actually there's something there's somebody somebody has that I really want, like desperately want, and that is a David's faith. The faith that David ha- had is something that I truly want. Regardless of you know what it costs, man, I would just love to have faith like his. And actually, looking through verse 144, you can learn a lot about David because it's one of his psalms. And it speaks a lot about the essence of his faith in here. It tells about what exactly what kind of faith he had. And the answer to that question of what kind of faith he had is clear in this passage. Let's look again at verse 1, and that part way through anyway. Um, it says, Praise be, uh, be the Lord of my rock, who trains my fingers for war. Uh, my trains my hands for war, and my fingers for battle. So you're talking about training your fingers. What does that mean? Well, it's kind of like going like this, wiggling your finger up and down, huh? In that time, in that day, fingers and hands 
were actually used uh, mainly to hold weapons, to shoot arrow from a bow or to hold a sword or a shield and do something like that to fight. So fingers and hands were really important. And to have strong fingers and strong hands had a different meaning in those days. It was something that allowed one to fight properly. So to train your fingers, actually that uh, word train has the meaning of teach as well. In David's life, he had to face all kinds of different battles. And his life in and of itself was just like going from one battle to the next. However, he knew that each time he faced a battle, he would have to like really uh, depend on God because each of the battles he faced were completely different. And so each and every time he would have to rely on God to know how to fight that battle. God provided him with that guidance, and so in this way, he truly was able to strengthen his hands and fingers. In David's life, one of the, f- the first battles he faced was when he was 15 years old, when he was up against the Philistine giant of Goliath. He was up against the Philistines, and they were had their strongest uh, uh, warrior with him, and he was just extremely tall, and David was up against him alone. At that time, David was able to attain victory. In his hand, he had a slingshot and a rock. And he said the following. He said, in the name of the Lord Almighty, I will stand against you. And David used his slingshot and he slung it around. And with just one stone, he was able to hit Goliath in the forehead. And that uh, killed him instantly. He fell down. So, in this way, David won the battle by using a slingshot. The next battle he had to face, however, was against King Saul when he was running away from him for his very own life. At this time, David was taught by God to fight this kind of a battle by giving it all to God, putting everything before God. He wasn't able to... He, he actually had the chance to kill Saul using his hands, but he chose not to. He said that he would not touch the Lord's anointed. He would not kill someone who the Lord had anointed with his own hands. He said that was retaliation against God, and so he actually left it up to God instead. The fight against Saul, therefore, was actually one used not by the slingshot, but actually putting things before God. And over time, Saul actually would be killed by the Philistines. One of the next big battles that David had to face was one of, uh, actually against his son Absalom, when his Absalom was after King David's life. At this time, David fought back by actually not retaliating but actually being content with humiliation. He knew that the reason for the whole battle in the first place was in and of himself. He had done something wrong when he was raising his son, so he had to accept that. As a result, the battle ended in David's victory. In David's life, there were many different battles that he had to face, And in each and every one, he had to fight in a different way. So he really had to trust God and trust God's uh, um, deliverance of him. Because of that, the way David fought was not just one simpler way. (laughs) This is a Japanese play on (laughs) joke. (laughs) Can't translate in English. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Anyway, David didn't just fight in one way. However, there was a common element to all of his battles. That is that he had to trust God in every case. By relying on the Lord, every time he attained victory, he would always say that the Lord has delivered the enemy into my hands. The Lord has given me victory, and he would always give the glory to the Lord and not himself. This is also very evident. You know, God, uh, David's um, thoughts are always very evident in verse 2, where he says that loving 
God is uh, God is His grace, His fortress, His stronghold, deliverer, shield, refuge, and also one who subdues people under Himself. This expression is one that shows that if God wasn't protecting David, then David would have been totally weak and unable to uh, stand on his own. He is proclaiming that the reason why he had was given victory is because of God. Looking in verses 3 and 4, David proclaims his weaknesses. He says that because he was so weak, there was only reason he was able to win the battles was because the Lord was giving him strength at those times. And in verses 5 through 8, he proclaims God's great power and how he was able to defeat the enemy because of it. God gave David these victories because And he is the same God that we are worshiping today. David lived about a thousand years um, prior to Jesus, so about three thousand years ago from now. However, the the same God that he worshipped at that time is the same God we are worshiping today. Lord, had, the God has not changed in these past three thousand years. He is the same God who gives us victories in our lives today. In order, f- in because of that, we can we should learn from David's faith. As I always say, the God that we believe in is the God who has created both heaven and earth. He is a God that has created humans, not a God that is created by humans. A while ago, one of my friends went to Nepal, and he saw something really interesting. He was walking through the streets there, and he saw children. And the children were like pounding away at、uh, stones there on the side of the road, and so they were making something, obviously. So he asked them, "What are you making?" And he said, "We're making gods." They said they were making, you know, carving out gods as like their part as their part-time job. And when they were done, the adults would come and buy these things. They would pay a lot of money for these false gods the kids had made. And then they would take it home and put it in the best place in their house. And then they would,、uh, you know, ask for help and、uh, assurance and encouragement from this false god every day. And that truly is an idol. It's something that people made, and especially in this case, it was something kids made just as a part-time job. And here, these adults would put that in their house, a prominent place in their house, and like pray to it. When you think about this, this is just absurd. Anything that humans have made. Is something that can't save a human. There's no possible way that could happen. And when you're thinking about that、uh, truth, you can really think about this in a more imp-、uh, and realize just how、uh, worthless idol worship truly is. If you think about the theory of evolution, it states that、uh, humans have evolved over time from other organisms. However, It's not. It's. It's not evident in history that there's any、uh, organisms have evolved into humans because, if they did, then there would be some like midway point. There wouldn't be something like all of a sudden it changed from one thing completely to something different. There should be something that like、um, indicates that it happened, but there's no fossils that can prove that. Not a single one. So, the most recent, the latest、um, theory of evolution just says that one form of an organism, when it was、uh, changing to another organism, it actually gathered them all together and said <laughs> that they would <laughs> they would get into this other form the next day, and then there was nothing in between. What do you think of this, though? This isn't science. This is just like an occult. <laughs> However, there are some people that actually believe this and、uh, proclaim it. If there's a pregnant woman, for example, you would likely ask, "Is your baby going to be a boy or a girl?" Right? 
you wouldn't ask the, the woman, do you have a baby in your stomach or an animal? Only humans give birth to humans. And that's the same today as it was long ago. It's a fact. It's something that has been uh, decided by our um, you know, enzymes and genes and so on. We can't, humans can't give birth to some other uh, organism. In this world, we have the creator God, and he, his, this world is full of his wisdom. Perhaps you've heard of Nito Denko Corporation. This uh, company has developed something called gecko tape or yamori tape. And it's a special kind of tape that has huge adhesive properties. If it's something, if you, you know, use it to stick something up, like it's not coming off. But it can be peeled off really easily. Pretty amazing, huh? And this idea to make this gecko tape was actually developed from the name of the tape, from geckos or lizards. Perhaps you've seen a gecko or lizard before, right? You can see how sometimes they walk on walls and houses or even on ceilings. In, you know, class houses these days, they don't really get in. But in, you know, the old days, you know, there would, you would often see lizards in houses. And on the ceiling, sometimes they are, you can see them walking upside down. And they can be just like hanging there with one foot. <laughs> They're just stuck to the ceiling and it's pretty amazing. But they can also eat and walk very easily. And so the company, person who worked at the company got a hint from these uh, gecko lizards and uh, studied their feet and how they were able to stick to the ceiling so well. And they discovered that there were these tiny little downy hairs that are 200 nanometers on their feet. And because of these little tiny hairs, they were able to use the van der Waals force and this is a scientific word here. Um, so the van der Waals force is what enables these uh, animals to walk upside down. It's uh, something that has to do with gravity and this repulsive force that enables them to uh, walk in such a manner upside down on a ceiling, for example. So the geckos have been doing this for years, obviously. And... But <laughs> Nito Denko Corporation person didn't ask their permission to use uh, this information to create their product. So the natural realm and the natural world has a ton of wisdom in it. And that's how you can tell that it was created with by God, the God of the Bible. In the Bible, it explains how the, the greatest thing that God made is actually us humans. David was very well aware of this as well. That's why in thir verse 3, he says, Lord, what are human beings that you, you care for them, mere mortals that you think of them? They are like a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. He's saying that God has created such amazing beings but yet they live just a very short time. So it's amazing that he uh, thinks so highly of such beings as ourselves. And actually, this is a word think of means visit. And so God loves us so much that he visit us. And that way of visiting of the first time was through Jesus Christ in the first Christmas when he came 2,000 years ago to save us. He visited us and he thought of us in a sense here. So why is it that God blessed David? Well, it's one of the reasons is because he was very humble. He realized he was very helpless, and that he was a very had a very low, uh, very low and weak state. He knew that, in because of his weakness, then God's uh, strength could work very well. Ra in the New Testament, there's somebody who realized this as well. That's Paul. Paul, he actually said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient is for you. He is proclaiming how God, God's strength and power is sufficient. Both David and Paul were 
you know, actually not that weak people, if you think about it. There's many things they could have, you know, thought strongly about themselves. David himself was a king. He had authority and power and fame, and he had all of that going for him. And he actually he was a superior warrior and a musician, and he was just full of God's、uh, glory. So there's a lot of things that actually were really good for him. But still, he said he was very weak and he needed God's help. And Paul, in the day of the, that day, he was also a very elite、uh, Jewish person. But he said that he was weak and that before God he was nothing. Only before God would he, would he be given、uh, strength. This is David's faith. One other aspect is in verse 9. I will sing a new song to you, my God. On the ten string lyre, I will make music to you. So, for David, he realized that the, the highest priority was to worship God, regardless of what was going on. The reason why is that the resolution to any and every problem is in the Lord God. And that when he's worshiping the Lord, that's when he's given strength from him. So David also wrote、uh, Psalm 130, 103. And in that psalm, he also was praising the Lord. He said, Praise the Lord, my soul. He was saying that to himself. He said, My soul, and praise the Lord. He was realizing that as he was holding his hand to his heart, that he, his soul was in there and he was telling himself the importance of praising the Lord. And he says, All, all my inmost being praise his holy name. He was just telling himself that all of himself, all of his feelings, all of his intents, all of his desires, all of his existence, that he just truly wanted to totally praise the Lord. And he was. Um, building himself up in a sense to do so. And he wanted to be an amazing worshiper of God, so he was encouraging himself to do so. Through the worshiping of God, then、uh, he realized that all of his、uh, sins would be forgiven and that he would receive God's grace and then be able to serve him. And、uh, then he follows up by other words in, such, in that passage. David realized that the reason why he could go from victory to victory was because he was following the Lord and that all of his assistance and encouragement was from the Lord. It wasn't from that of himself, it was from God. And the way it did come to himself was because he was very、uh, imminent on worshiping God. Verses 10 through 14 in today's passage are talking about how David was、uh, blessed because of,、uh, his, of his faith in God. And in verse 12, it's talking about the sons and how his sons would be blessed. And 13 and 14 is talking about how he would be blessed financially. He would be blessed by the, the oxen and the sheep and, and so on. So, David, when he was looking over his life, he realized something really important. He realized that in his life, of course, he did have victory. He also had failure. He had success, but also failure. But he realized, regardless of what happened, and he re realized when he did have victories and when he did have failures and when he did have、uh, you know, sin in his life, he realized at, in all of those cases that. He had to just,、uh, he always realized that he was blessed when he worshiped God. When he、uh, stopped worshiping God, or temporarily even, that's when he had these、uh, sin in his life, or uh, 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 he failed as well. And so he realized that、uh, praising God was essential. When he was ending his life, he called Solomon to him and he left、uh, final words for him. If you, at the end of your life, were to give final words to the people you loved, what is it that you would say? You would say the most important things, right? 
you would say, oh, I left my, you know, savings account book somewhere and I put this, that, this, that there were, and you, you wouldn't talk about things. And of course, you know, money is important, but not when you're like on your deathbed. So David, when he was in, about to die, he told his son Solomon the following in First Chronicles uh, 28, 9, and you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father. And so he's just talking about the same God that he's believed in, and he wants his son to know him. And serve him with a wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. And he's talking about, you know, with, with a willing mind, not, you know, and to, you know, be willing to follow God. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. In other words, he uh, was saying to Solomon, you're going to be the next king, and if you want to have victory or if you want to fail, it's all going to be dependent upon if you worship God or not. Worshiping God will allow you to have victory, but if you don't, if you stopped worshiping God, then you will be headed for destruction, and it's all your to you. It's all your choice. The Bible uh, reflects on David's uh, David's life at the end in First Chronicles twenty nine twenty eight by saying he David died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. So. At the end of uh, today's passage, uh, David said the following, Blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. So from Psalm 144, we can learn from David's faith. And I said at first, this is something I want to steal from him if I could. <laughs> you know, I want to become like him and, I, and to worship God and be blessed and because of that, as the new year is about to begin, I encourage you to also do so. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 2020 is about to come to an end. In the ancient days, we know that such a pandemic would have been um, proclaimed. However, we can also look on year 2020 as a year that was full of the Lord's blessing. In this past year, there's been a lot of grace that God has bestowed upon us and blessings too. God has done many wonderful things, and you tell us, the Lord, not to forget any of the wonderful things you've done for us. So, Lord, allow us to really count our blessings that we've had this past year and to have a, a very grateful heart. In the new year, Lord, we ask for your further blessing upon us. And we believe that this will happen. Lord, allow us to learn from David's faith and to be blessed with your abounding love. Lord, allow us to grow even more in our faith. We pray in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, with gratitude. Amen. Let's have a moment of prayer and silence.